Welcome to Canal Tears, Voice of the Diaspora, Explore Your Past. Today I have a very special show, it's about a Turkish Cypriot mosque in London. And I have with me Erkin Güney from the Ramadan Mosque. Hello Erkin Bey. How are you doing Mustafa? Oh very well, it's great to see you. Although I can't see you in person because of the COVID, it's great to see you online nonetheless. Well thank you, thank you for inviting me. and. Um... Yeah, it's it's quite humbling to be a part of the Turkish community and trying to get some uh, some of the information out, and some history out about what's where we've been and where we're going. Excellent. As I mentioned, you are representing the Ramadan Mosque. Yeah, Shackle Lane, Shackle Lane. In, Shackle Lane in, in Hackney, in London. Yeah. Um, but we're going to be talking a bit about the history and a bit about the, your family's involvement with the mosque as well. Yeah. Um, but could we start off with a bit of an introduction as to who you are, please, for the audience? Okay, so my my full name is Erkin Ramadan Gune. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people know me as Egg, which is my nickname um, for many, many years. I've grown up in London. I was born in London. And... Um, mm -hmm. Um grew up firstly, well, my, my parents, uh, Ramadan Gune and Suwe Lagune, my mum and dad. Um, and obviously growing up as a, a little child under their influences uh, was quite an amazing journey, really, to say the least. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a London boy, Turkish Cypriot, and uh, I'm the chairman of Shakwale Mosque, Ramadan Jamisi, which is the first Turkish Turkish mosque in the United Kingdom um, since 1977. It was established for our for our community to deal with all the challenges and the requirements that we uh, that we needed from nikahs, from bringing the community together, from teaching the. Uh, Turkish schools, Quran class, uh, classes, and um, funeral services. Um, basically, it's it's it was well, it's the first Turkish mosque, so it's the hub for the Turkish Cypriot community. Definitely, and also the, the Gune family has played a prominent part within the Turkish Cypriot community. Could you tell us a bit about your your Ahmetlik, your your mum and dad, Ramadan Gune and Suheyla? Both of them rest. Um, may they both be blessed. You know, uh, they were very committed to their people, to Cyprus. Um, my my um, my mum and dad, well, my mum and dad, they were very special to me. But equally, we grew up with majority of the Turkish Cypriots coming to our house, the Turks, uh, for help because. When my dad came here, my mum and dad came here, um, they kind of like showed the way for most of our community, how to settle, where to settle, where to base the community. Um, I remember growing up um, as a child, um, some some memories that always stayed with me. My mum used to have a record shop. First mm -hmm. record shop was in St John Street in Angel. That was in the... Uh, late 60s early 70s uh equator record so we thought everybody grew up the way we grew up because we didn't know any different um but you know we were the only family in north london that had 300 chickens in the back garden with <laughs> with the goat and the alsatian sleeping together um you know culturally the influence was always there uh dad's background later on i started to discover my dad's um commitment to his his people his island to cyprus mm -hmm. and you know so let's start with let's start with my mum my mum um had the record shop that was her life she loved to sing she produced a couple of albums a lot of our community a lot of our musicians that played at the turkish weddings and um, the sons players and the singers and from Turkey, Cyprus, they all come to that shop. You know, that shop supplied um, tapes, music, concerts. We're done with a lot of our father's and mother's generation. 
um, all the weddings. So we were really, really blessed with that flavour and that, that contribution from our community. So, you know, from St John Street, uh, Equator Records, we meet, we moved over to Newington Green, Green Lane. So we had Music Dunyasa there, which was mums. Every day um, from nine to nine, my mum would get up, uh, bringing over all the Turkish artists, singers, all the tapes, all the Elvises, like the Sunnet outfits, um, um, the flags, the books, the test bits, all the necklace, everything to do with Turkish and Turkish Cypriot from Turkey was imported by dad. Mum shop was there and our community uh, would come there. So a lot of the community that i grown up with, Dayungdur, Dayzengdir, Yeningdir, they'd all come to the shop. So I thought, wow, we've got a really big family. So I didn't know any different or any better. And... Um, you know, we we just serve the community in that aspect. And, um, you know, God bless mum's soul up until the day she died. She passed away on uh, New Year's Day, 92, uh, 92, which was obviously a shock for us because it it wasn't really wasn't expected. And I was in my 20s. So that was really, really difficult for me. Um, and, you know, I lost my routine. Um, because you know your mum, your mum is the family. She cooks, she cleans, she feeds you. She never tells you. She tells you off, but you're never wrong. She's your mum. She's our angel, and I and I believe she's still present. I can't say enough about my mum. Um, she really did look after all of us. Um, she would feed the strangers that would come over from Cyprus that were hungry. I think you can ask the community um, about mum or what she's done for the community. She never saw, she taught us that we were really, very lucky and we should uh, always do what we can, feed. We'd take presents to Cyprus by the, the valley's loads. Um, so my mum, she was everything to us, you know, she was a, she was an angel, you know. Um, there is nothing that I can say. My mum unconditionally loved us and we didn't realise her worth, you know. And as I said, tragically, she passed New Year's Day 92. In her lifetime, Emel Sayans, Shukranay, Zeki Murens, Bülent Ersoys, Barış Manchos, all, um, all of the Turkish artists in those days would come to our shop. Um, we would promote their music. Then you'd have... All the musicians that we have today, a lot of the old school musicians that played, they would come and buy their tapes from mum. So it was quite, you know, it was quite a, um, how can I say, a vine. It was quite a, 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 a route for the community to come to buy their romans, their books, their tapes. And, you know, she would sit there, she would know the customers, she would know the families, she would know the taste of their music, and she would go, ha ha, sign up, yap dumbu And she would take the records one by one, record them, and then master them and give them to the customers. So she she gave music, you know, what would life be without music? So she brought that to the community. And, and we grew up, I grew up on the doorstep of that shop. While that was all going on, my father's uh, journey and his commitment, as far as I understand and the stories that I've been told by many people, my dad's contribution to the Turkish Cypriot community before Temete, uh, there was a group called the Volkans and he was one of the founders of Volkans. This is what I've been told um, in Inunu. There was a little secret head office and he would initiate when the uprise was taking place and they were doing the ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Turkish shipments in Cyprus. My dad was one of many of our fathers at those days that stood up to fight for his country. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, he was exiled. He was forced to leave Cyprus by the British government because he was a problem for the British government. And, and obviously we know what their game was. Their game was to build their British bases so they could 
do what they've done to the Middle East right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was quite a prominent man. And I found most of this out later. Um, what he'd done for his community, he was kicked out of Cyprus because he was a problem for the British. So they said to him, America, uh, Australia or Britain. So he came here and he wasn't allowed to go back until the, the mid-70s, I believe. Um, just before, I think it was just before, maybe it might have been just before the war. Um, and so he's positioned in the Turkish community. I We grew up in the arena of Gülen Ecevi, uh, the leader of the uh, Turkish army, uh, Turkish, um, Alpaslan, um, very powerful people, you know, and very good people from my understanding. But to me, I was a young kid. I didn't really know who they were and where they stood. Um, mm -hmm. It took me a little while for the penny to drop to realise that, you know, uh, you know, because it was kind of like, um, don't go into your room, your uncle's sleeping in your room. It was one of those ones. I don't know if... In a Turkey Cypriot family, everyone must have experienced So it was like, well, which day is it now, Dad? So, you know, I can say Turkish stayed in my room and I'd get the ump with him. Is it you again? So sort of <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking back. Uh, I'll pass on Turkish in your, in your bedroom. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'd have a go at him for staying in my bed, not knowing who he was. Um, and then, you know, Bülent Ejebi, God bless him, um, from my understanding, he was one of the best uh, leaders of his time, you know. And so we grew up with with this political arena with this it was quite a heavy burden to carry and dad set up with his community initially we we had um number 16 green lanes which was the masjid uh, mm. which was the first base which was uh london london took uh, islamic um jimmy to something like that litra um and then we that they my mum, my dad, and my uncle Kino put their properties down to secure Shakur Lane Mosque. Um, mm -hmm. And this was formulated in 1977. And a lot of help from the community. Everybody helped. So, you know, um, a massive thing, not only to set up the mosque, the first Turkish mosque in the United Kingdom. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy title, you know. And... Yeah not realising ourselves, myself as a kid, because, you know, we got a little bit lost along the way. We got a little bit brainwashed. Uh, we, we we thought we were English, you know. Um, no offence, but, you know, we, we got a little bit lost. Um, mm -hmm. Culturally, thankfully, our foods, our tradition, our music. If I didn't grow up in the Turkish record shop, I don't think I would have been, I would have been more disconnected. So um, I have to thank... Allah for the journey that I've had because it just kept me in touch with what was going on and I you know um, following in my dad's footsteps wasn't something that I'd planned or, or understood um, politics is not an arena that I I, I like because um, they don't seem to get things done these politicians so you know i like to get up and get on with things and i don't want to take sides you know um i have a completely different view about things i'm a turkish cypriot i'm a muslim and i'm proud okay nothing will change that that's my my lineage babam baflu recha so you know from what i hear recha was one of the most dangerous villages. He was either a, a judge or a contract killer or a hitman or something like that, they told me. Um, my mum my my come from uh, Iskele, Pile size, Lanaka. Um, and, you know, my mum's brothers, Ma Mer Dayum, um, Kinal Dayum, Altan Dayum, from my mum's side. Nurefe uh, Deizer, my mum's oldest sister. Um, 
amazing family, beautiful uh, family. I've got loads of beautiful cousins from mum's side. Dad's and my nene, Melik. I didn't know my granddad. Um, but while my mum and dad were at work, my nene used to look after me. And so, you know, all these influences, all of this journey was quite colourful. But at the same time, you know, it came at a price. You know, it came at a cost because there was things that was going on that we didn't understand. You know, when you go to school here and you come home, you kind of like slightly disconnected. You don't find peace at home because your parents come from a different time and era. And, uh, you know, my dad was committed to his community, to, polit to politics, setting up the first Turkish mosque and being one of the founders of uh, Volkans before Temete um, came with a price. You know, my dad was considered a threat, you know. I remember uh, one time the CIA come to the shop and they asking my dad, um, Mr. Gunay, we hear the Queen's life is in danger. And my dad said, what the Queen done to anybody? Um, I remember the, like, who's that bloke, Dad? You know, it's like that for us. It's like he's from, he's from CIA from America. Um, why is he asking you that? So that Maybe he think I got the answer. So it was, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of like that. And we just thought, real. all right, then, you know, um, you know, I remember being in very many, because I grew up in that arena. Do you remember yeah. with the Denk Tushies, with the Brilliant Edge events, with all of that growing up and just taking it for granted. You know, I thought everybody grew up the same way. Um, and so you grow up and you realise, hold on a minute, um, something's not right. And then you start realising that your friends are not your friends because they have a different view on things. My dad was very politically involved, so there was quite a lot there. And I'm, I'm, proud, I'm proud of my dad. Um, I had a very difficult time with my dad um, in my younger days because I was a handful, you know. Um, and it ain't be it hasn't been easy being the son of Ramadan Gune and you know the mosque in those days were being attacked by the National Front by the BNP pigs heads if it wasn't that side it might have been the political influence from Turkey so we'd have petrol bombs at the mosque and I'd have to be here with my friends defending the mosque so you know. It was, a, it was quite a struggle and I really didn't pay that much attention internally because I, I was quite disconnected from my, my um, religious side of things because of the, those days the teachers was, you know, it was all fear-based, you know. You think, oh, look, you know, better get out of here, all this stuff is going to help you know because you don't understand you know i'm not blaming the teachers um i think they could have used a lot better method than fear because you know some people don't take to being scared to, to learn they need to be taught and to and to and to give them time to understand um so we didn't have that luxury uh, and we were expected to know the quran off the back of our hearts and it, 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 it it just, it didn't happen, you know. We were coming to the mosque and we didn't know what to do. And then we were going to school singing Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. So we were confused, you know. I'm not the only one. I'm telling you how it is. So my dad, as I said, was very influential. Um, and I suppose putting that one to the community, who he helped, what he helped, I remember... Every day, my dad would be applying for passports for members of the community that have come over from Cyprus. They come to settle because of the up, upheaval and the, the, the ethnic cleansing that was going on in Cyprus. So I remember every day we we're making an application for another family member or another family to get their passports. And in those days, they were the, the blue ones. So it was, he had his office, he had his community, he had his base. And we didn't, we didn't get it, you know, we just, we just didn't get 
what his role was until later on. Um, so waking up and realising I, I was actually targeted because of my dad's position in the community by the establishment, you know. Um, also, my father was the man that put the bow money up for us in Nadia, you know. Um, that caused us a lot of problems. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of like come at a time where we didn't need to have this aggravation. It was a lot of pressure for my dad. Um, so, yeah, I mean, quite extreme positions from extreme positions. His contribution to the community, the funeral service, um, a base for the community to come. Uh, in those days, this mosque was one of the most busiest and supported mosques. It's an independent mosque, okay? It doesn't get any support from the DNS or any of the other parties. We try to manage this the way we manage it because um, of the, the issues that it's had in the past, let's just say. But the mosque, Sheikh Nazim was here in those days, um, Jamal Hoja, we had some of the greatest people come here um and what the, the mosque's service purpose was uh was to wash our bodies pray for our bodies bury within the 24 hours and try to adhere to the uh, needs and the tradition of our community so i mean that's a huge thing um the last june is the most sacred the prayers are equally sa are sacred so that was one of its key roles, and as I said, to teach the Quran, uh, have Turkish schools here, youth centres, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it was it was big, but you know, at that time, we were we were looking the wrong way. We didn't listen enough. Um, it's not that he didn't pull my ear; he pulled my ear, but um, he pulled the wrong way. <laughs> So your father played a critical role in the establishment of the mosque, clearly, yeah. and, and he was a prominent member of the community as well. Um, do you know why, what the motivation was? Like, what, how did it come to his mind to establish the mosque? Okay, so uh, the motivation was, and I can, I can, I can categorically say this because it was difficult times for us when people mm. in our community passed away. They would be left in the hospital mortuaries, or they would be left in uh, English undertakers. And this was something that we didn't want because they were not adhering to our tradition. They did not adhere to our, um, our, our ways of preparation, our washing, our sacredness of the last journey. You know, I'm not knocking uh, the Christian path, okay? But we have uh, a very sacred way of doing things. We wash, we pray. And while that takes place, we do the wrapping in the kefen. Um, it's very sacred. We're handing over back to Allah. Okay, mm -hmm. we have a moral duty as Muslims to do it in the correct way, um, uh, as close as we can. And you know, I think this was the foundations. This was the reasoning behind it. There was nothing in place. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember. And I'm gonna, I remember this very clearly. I remember um, at number 16 Green Lanes, the Masjid, which was the first place, I remember them washing a body and wrapping it up and bringing it up the stairs. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? This is like out of a movie. What, what, what's going on? Help us with the body. And I'm thinking, what, what, what's going on? It was kind of like, I was, I was, I was young. Um, and so I thought, this ain't, this ain't how this is supposed to be. But mm. the thing is, we, we, we didn't know any different. Uh, what, we, what we're used to is let the undertaker take care of it and you don't mm. see anything. Um, so when you wake up, when you realise actually it's the last thing we should be doing for our loved one if we can. We should play a role in washing the body, if we can, okay? We should play a role in that most sacred journey and what that means to the families, 
um, and and the, the spiritual aspect and the tradition, the culture, it really is a powerful and it is a beautiful thing what we do for our loved ones. Um, and then the, the, the mosque, Sheikh uh was set up uh, purposely. We've got everything here in-house. We've got mortuary area, fridge area. Uh, we've got a wash area. We've got a preparation area. Once that's all done, we've got the mosque where, um, inside where we do the prayers. So we come from one part of the uh, mosque into mm. the prayer area. The prayers are said. And then we make our final journey to the final resting place. And then we backfill. This should have happened, what well, used to happen within 24 hours. The challenges have changed completely now. We're very, it feels like they're trying to disconnect us from our tradition. But that was the purpose. That was the sole purpose uh, because of those difficulties. And I remember the families traumatized because we couldn't do what we wanted to do for our loved ones. And I remember them saying, English So it was quite powerful. Um, and obviously, the prayers, bringing the community together, teaching. Uh, there's a lot of people that I've met along the way that used to come to the mosque in their childhood to uh, uh, learn the Quran, um, wow. which quite is quite moving. I think, I think Mustafa, you're one of them. You probably... You come to this mosque as a child. Is that right or have I got that wrong? Not regularly, but I have uh, this come and go to the mosque. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of the communities. Say, I used to come here when I was a, a kid. We had a martial arts um, space upstairs um, mm. for a while. So the community was coming here for that. It was to serve our community. You know, it's very simple. It was very Turkish. It was very Turkish. Uh, in its uh, existence and the the purpose that it served was for the community you know it's not a selfish thing it's something to to bring everybody together and if anybody in our community is having difficulties they would find someone that would have a solution or an answer or find or show the way you know mm -hmm. that's what this place was and this is what i try to do with the resources that i have i try to do the best that i can so um yeah, I mean, it was it's the first Turkish mosque in the United Kingdom. You know, it's it's powerful. Just 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 the title. It, it, it's nineteen seventy-seven. Uh, we should all be proud as Turkish Cypriots to be a part of this history. You know, and then as our dads, our mums and dads have been a part of this. You know, and sadly, our young generation uh, they need to play an active role. They don't need to pray five times a day. They need to come down and be a part and be connected. You know, a lot of the community are difficult, having difficulties at the moment. So I try and support and do what I can in that aspect. So I feel like I've taken a little bit of my mum, uh, a little bit of my dad, um, my mistakes, and try to be the best version of myself. This is where I am now. You know, and, and I'm. It was never, never, Mustafa, trust me, it was never, never planned for me to be um, running the mosque or actually being uh, a funeral director in that role. Um, how did you get involved? How did I get involved? He forced me into it <laughs> from up there, <laughs> didn't he? Um, how did I get involved? Good question. He bought that th this is going back again. Brookwood Cemetery, initially we bought I think it was 19 acres in the UK Turkish Islamic Trust name. Mm -hmm. And that was at Brookwood. And those who know about Brookwood, it was the first Muslim burial ground. Uh, it was a set up as the London Necropolis. We got a Turkish chairman there. We got William Pulliam, Mahmoud Pistol, Yusuf Ali, the translators of the Quran. Some very, very historical people. And he bought this land to bury our community because there wasn't no place. Um, we're facing that challenge as we speak. We need another Turkish Cypriot or Turkish cemetery that's managed by us. And this was what Brookwood was. We um, my initially bought the, the 19 acres and then I think that was in 83. And then in 85, he bought the whole cemetery. You know, I remember it vividly. I was like, 
is I bought a cemetery, Babam. I said, what? He said, I, 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 bought, I bought cemeteries, like garden, Heaven's Garden. Is that and not the largest uh, cemetery in the UK? Largest cemetery, once upon a time, the largest cemetery in the world, the largest what? cemetery in Europe. Um, it was set up as an act of parliament by the Queen. Um, 2,000 acres was uh, given up um, by one of the lords. Um, and 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 it was set up to deal with London's overcrowding initially because London at that time was full. So what they'd done, they exhumed all the churchyards and the cemeteries back then and reinterred them at Brookwood. So mm. Brookwood was the only London cemetery. It had used to have a train line from Waterloo, first, second, and third uh, class paupers, burials straight into the station, into the cemetery from Waterloo, into Brookwood, and then they would do the burials. A lot, a lot of history there. A lot of our Turkish community, a lot of our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters, a lot of history from all over the world is uh, there. I mean, I, I, we, we owned it for 35 years. Um, Tragically, we lost it in a in a court case, which for another story, um, uh, another day. Um, but yeah, we've run it. I managed it with Dad. Um, I was a director there since 1985, um, and you know, this is what he done to me, Mustafa. He said, "This is beautiful," and he gave me a bow saw. He said, "Had it." I said, "What's this?" He said, "Start cutting back." I had to start cutting back the rhododendrons to discover and to create what you see today. Um, mm -hmm. I've, done, I've done many years up there, and uh, and and it is what well, it is. It is a very sacred place, very beautiful place. Um, so that was set up to do with our community. What he was thinking, I think you know, he grew up without a dad. He grew up without a mum uh, from a very young age, from the age of four. With uh four sisters um three sisters sorry and um i suppose that influenced him um the fact that he was dealing with at that time the loss of our communities that were coming over and preparing their funerals in their last journey I suppose that influenced him, saying, look, we've got a problem here for our community. You know, he was quite a clever man. He was quite a visionary. And he's, he saw the problem. He saw the problem that we're having today. You know, we, we, we can't bury within 24 hours. We don't own any burial spaces that we can do our burials when we need to, the way we need to. Um, and this is a huge problem for our community right now. You know, as we speak... Um, Certain cemeteries are completely past the limit many, many years ago that we use. Um, and we need to uh, we need to source we need some we need some money in the community to come together to buy an area to cater for their needs. We're not we're all making this journey, okay? So we all need to think about where we're gonna be laid to rest. No nobody's gonna live forever, so this is a very serious matter, and I suppose this is what the mosque was doing. It was giving that uh, ability to bury within the time frame at Brookwood, do the washing, and serving the community in the, in the most important way. This is prob probably one of the most important parts of what the mosque does. Um, you know, in the name of love, in the name of Allah, uh, this is the most sacred journey uh, there is. There's no two ways about it. It's not, oh, maybe this or that. It is, you know. It's the last journey. It's everybody's responsibility to try and play a role in that, to, to lay our loved ones to rest and to support our community in the time of grief, our uh, most vulnerable. Um, and, you know, we find a lot of power in our healing through prayers. And, and we rely on our Hodges to do the prayers and to uh, give us hope and faith and belief. You know, we've got, you know, we've got, we've got at the moment 
Hussein Hodja is one of our best Hodjas. Um, and that poor man is knocking himself out. Uh, we, we're challenged with the pandemic situation, as you know. Um, it's been quite traumatic, to say the least, uh, for the community and for ourselves. Um, and we're trying to keep a professional um, a way about ourselves. It gets very emotional for us, and we're dealing with very, very tragic circumstances where more than one or two members of the family are passing away, um, and we're trying to accommodate them. This is a situation we have now, um, currently, um, we've got a high volume of my community passing away. We can't register as quickly as we'd like to, so we've got a delay there. We can't bury within the 24 hours because we're in a chain with the coroners and other funeral directors. Um, mm. Then we've got the cemeteries that can't dig the graves quick enough. You know, at the moment, in this current situation, we've had, uh, within the last 10 days, 35 members of our community pass away, okay? 35 members of our community, their mums, dads, brothers and sisters of our community. So. These are, this is a massive, massive impact. And at the beginning of the year, we had the same challenges where we were trying to get them back to Cyprus, where we were trying to uh, comfort and deal with everyone, uh, everybody and everybody's loved ones and their needs. You know, and you've got, we've got Aydin Mehdi Noja and we've got Hussein Noja to try to uh, sustain the demand. There's a lot of pressure on Hussein. And uh, it's a lot of pressure on us, you know. I'm not here on my own. I've got my wife, I've got my children, my team, I've got Jem, I've got Cam, uh, my own children. We are doing the best we can. I've got some members, even us, you know, we're losing members of our own family, and mm -hmm. it breaks us, man. You know, it, it breaks us, but at the same time, what my dad, what my mum's taught me. You have to keep this as dignified and as respectful. This is the most sacred journey we make. And if you're not a believer, when you experience grief and loss, you start becoming conscious and you start waking up and start realising that there is something more, you know. I've seen quite a lot with my own eyes. Living at Brookwood Cemetery uh, for nine years myself um, and and being responsible for every religion, every culture, every tradition's burial. Um, anyone, any pick any culture, I've done every procedure for every every community, okay? So, and what I see commonly is the prayers, mm -hmm. the families grieving, and the way they try to deal with the grieving, the, uh, the families and how that is affected and what our roles are there and and we try and help with the grieving process so this this is what the mosque does mm. this is one of its other roles to support the community um that are experiencing uh grief and loss or mental illnesses or you know addictions or whatever it may be we should be here playing that role to support not throw stones Oh, uh, you know, so we have to look at the way we, our approach and how our youngins are behaving towards what this means. And mm -hmm. they need to, look, I just, I just want to make this clear, Mustafa, because it's really important. Anyone that knows me, all right, will know that this was the last place that I was going to end up, okay? I never believed in my wildest dreams that I was going to be a funeral director at the mosque, okay? My own experiences taught me um, and what I thought was success and what I thought was um, uh, achievements, I was, I felt I felt cheated, I was misled. You know, all the fast cars and the big houses doesn't bring you peace, okay? It has absolutely no, no value. It's what you do next, you know, what it's taught me is to be the best version of myself, I come here, I had to commit myself because of the situation the mosque was in. Um, it had been neglected. We were dealing with our own 
grief, you know. My father was murdered out in Cyprus, and I don't know if everybody knows, but it's 15 years and we still haven't laid him to rest because of court cases in Cyprus, you know. So I understand what the last journey means. Excuse me. Well, I'm sure they'll be very proud of the work that you're doing because... It's a hard time for the community. Uh, like I said, I, I understand this journey better than everybody, better than most people. So, moral, morally, I'm obligated to be here. It's the right thing to do. I've done everything in my life. I've been very blessed. It hasn't been easy. It's been far from easy. Um, I've had my challenges. I've had, you know, I've I've been victimised by the state, by the police, by the government. I've been targeted because of who my father was. Um, we've had court cases and all that kind of stuff because of the power and the influence my dad had. Um, and that obviously concerned the governments here. Um, sadly, my dad's generation community weren't strong enough to get behind us. And I encourage... I encourage every Turkish Cypriot to stand together, stop throwing stones at each other, because you're going to need each other more than you think, okay? Don't think your mate down the road is going to help. Your best friend is your mum and dad and your brothers and sisters, and you need to unite and keep that unity. And I have to say this, I've been blessed in what I do, my role here, for the community i've seen some beautiful beautiful families how loving they are and how how beautiful it is to see that and then i've seen the other side of, of families where they don't get on and they've clashed and they don't talk and and that saddens me because i've seen that and i've experienced that myself as well and and the reason that happens is because support has failed um unity has failed we need to come together you know you might be all right on your own sitting there at home doing what you're doing, but when, you, when you're when you singled out and you've got no backup, they will take you out one at a time. So the message here is clear. In those days, when our parents stood together, nobody messed with us. What we've done is we've swallowed their pill, okay? We have to unswallow that pill. We have to un... We've, you know, we've swallowed the stupid pill. We need to unswallow the stupid pill and come together and unite as Turkish Cypriots. Cyprus needs to be recognised. Northern Tur the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Look what they've done to us. None of these governments here have actually said, you know what, um, we should solve the, the Cyprus problem. At. They ignored us like we're nothing because we're too clever, we're too intelligent, we're, we've got a beautiful part of the planet and they try to steal it from us um, and and some of our kids have lost the weight you know um, and again look again a very difficult journey a very different journey shall I say I've had myself I've done the club scene I've done the recording scene I've, uh, I'm the pool specialist by trade I started one of I was one of three companies that started the mobile phone game back in 1985. Um, I've done everything that I thought I wanted to do. Um, I've had as many cars. It's not bought me peace. My journey brings me here, okay? I now sleep here at the mosque, okay? And what it's given me is peace. It's given me peace that I never had all the way through my journey. It's given me purpose, and I'm, I'm humbled and honoured to be serving the community in the way that I do. Um, if that means picking up someone's loved one from home, we do that with integrity and dignified as possible. And we know that the person that's passed away, the spirit is very present when we do what we do. Mm -hmm. We wash the bodies. This is sacred. To be even a part of that is, a, is an honour. Okay, so we don't take this position lightly. We need to teach this to our kids. We need to reconnect them with our tradition, with what this journey means. I wish someone had showed me this 
and, and explain it to me when I was younger in the way that I try to do it now because it's sacred and it will bring us back to our true selves. You know, and then to do the prayers, I, I, I'm learning, you know. I'm not Islamically trained. I'm a funeral director. I've had training from the Islamic side. Um, I've had some beautiful brothers um, and sisters from all over to support and help. Um, and, you know, I've equally had some not so very nice people, but they're irrelevant. Um, I work with love and good intention. I try to do the best I can for our community. We try mm -hmm. and we, we go the extra mile. We don't need to. I don't need to be here. Okay. I did try and run away four times, but whatever it was, it put me back by my collar and I said, okay, I've done everything else. Let's let's see what this is. And I made up a lot of adjustments, Mustafa. It they're not the, we're not a normal mosque. Okay. We're in we're an independent mosque. We're not governed by the extreme view uh who use the terminology but out my son Jehanemi we base our teachings, uh, which is what it should be, with love um, and understanding of the Prophet, peace be upon him, what his message was. The translators of some of those have exploited the true message. You know, this guy, he was a simple man. He had a beautiful message. And we were so disconnected. Uh, I've been so, I'm talking about my, my, my generation, so disconnected that, what is all this? Because of the teachers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, our, tr our culture, our tradition, Islam, is beautiful, you know, uh, down to the artwork, the history, the amazing, um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm proud to say I've been to Mecca. I never see that one coming, you know. I've got pictures of me being in Mecca and I, I can't believe that I've made that journey and I encourage everybody if they get a chance or an opportunity, just try and make the journey, you know. Um, someone else said to me, my doctor said to me, you've got to go. And I said, well, you know, it's not, it's not me, but it is me. It has taught me a lot. It opened my eyes. It educated me. And um, I understand the teachings, um, you know. So... That's a we we here. That's just some of it, uh, Mustafa. Uh, that's a beautiful message there. I think it's uh, a great way to end there. Um, for those who are interested, because the mosque plays a central role in in communities, and certainly the Ramadan Jami has has played a central role in the Turkish Cypriot, the British Turkish Cypriot community. Yeah. For those who may be interested, uh, just before we conclude, can you just give a bit of information of how people can access the services uh, run by the mosque? Okay, so um, by yourself, Mustafa, if they're interested, um, um, Hussein Hoja, um, and I encourage anyone in the community that has something to offer the community. Um, obviously, we're dealing with this lockdown situation, this COVID times, but the space um, is here for the community. There are so many talented people in the community. There is, oh, I forgot his name, there is one guy who's a teacher who teaches Turkish. Um, he's going to kill me, I forgot his name. Um, he's up in Palmer's Green and he teaches, um, he set up one of the first Turkish schools. Now, we're not geared up because some adjustments need to be made, but we have such a, a very intelligent community to offer the community they can use this place as a platform to bring that together they can have talks you know if somebody wants to have a, a service here they're welcome to if um you know look i just i, I need to i need to mention this more stuff because this is really important as well we do the funerals here sometimes it's not practical for the families to do the funerals here as Turkish funeral directors, we can use Palmer's Green to do it, and it's done in a traditional way. But they need to come to us first, and then we can take control. We can get the imams, and we can do the service anywhere. At the moment, I think we're going back to graveside for the services. So the platform is here. The mosque is here. 
the facilities are here. It needs support. It needs help. But it ain't no good without the community. All right? You know, we need the young'uns to come here, play an active role. If they want to sit down and just listen to some of the stories, I'm quite happy to spend time. We should have, you know, uh, questions and answers, dialogue in the mosque, sitting there, open mic sessions, and try and exchange the, our thoughts and our experiences. So anybody can come to this mosque. Anyone with a good intention and love, okay, um, are more than welcome. And if they've got something to bring to the mosque, uh, to bring to the community, take advantage of, of, of the space and, and the history and the legacy of our Turkish community, you know, our Turkish community. This is this ain't just arrived. This has been here since 1977. As mm. I said, um, this one's for the young'uns. I grew up around here a very, very different way. And my journey brings me here. I'm at peace here. I spent many, many, many years running the streets of London, going to this part of the world and that part of the world to try and find what was missing. And what was missing was peace. And you find that when you stop looking over there and start looking in here and start understanding yourself. Um, understand the translation of the teachings of the Muhammad, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, because what he was trying to teach us um, was never to be judgmental, always to be supportive, you know, feed, give, you know, I find power in giving. I, I work with Muneve uh, Annemis, I call her mum. She's an angel, she's one of these angels. Uh, you know, there are people in our community that are um, challenged and still manage to hold. Uh, th these, these are warriors, man. These Turkish Cypriots, our women, are warriors, you know. We say in our even in our prayers, after our luck, heaven is found that the, the souls of our mums. Now you take that any way you want, but that tells me, and I know what my mum done for the community and her children, and there's plenty, plenty mums. We need to respect our mothers more, um, and we need to be together with our families more. So, you know, it's a beautiful message to end with, Edwin Bay. It's all about um, love. It's all about love. And it's a beautiful message to end with. Thank you for your time. Good stuff. And for those who look, are looking for peace, come down. If you're in the UK, if you're in London, come down to Shakuo Lane in Hackney, uh, Ramadan Jami. And you have Ed Kimbe and, and his team there who are, who are happy to support the team as well. Um, we've come to the end of the show today. And we hope to see you again in the next episode of Voice of the PS4 Explore Your Past. Thank you. Bless you. This is your mosque.